Hello and welcome to our lecture on strategy formation. This is an introductory lecture, just covering areas such as what is strategy and how do we make strategic decisions and what is a strategic decision, as well as how to plan the strategy within the business. Finally, then we'll look at governance, those guys that actually implement the strategy once we've decided what it is. This will set the scene for the rest of the module. This really says, right, what is it that we're going to be looking at and how will the module be structured? So strategy, first of all, strategy is defined by Johnson Scholes and Whittingham, who are three guys who wrote a book called Exploring Corporate Strategy as the long term direction or scope of the firm. So what can we take from that? Well, first of all, it's the long term direction or scope. We're not really thinking about short term decisions. Those are simply that decisions rather than a strategy for the direction that the firm should take. Now, when we think about those long term decisions, those long term direction or scope areas, well, we need to think about whether we're achieving competitive advantage. So the long term direction or scope will achieve that competitive advantage and it will make best use of the resources that we have available to us within the firm. Lastly, we need to fulfill stakeholder expectations. We'll talk a lot in the rest of this module about stakeholders. We'll be able to identify them. We'll be able to categorize them and we'll be able to really think what do they want from the business? When they want that, well, how can we actually provide it to them through our strategy? So strategy is defined as the long term direction or scope that achieves competitive advantage through best use of resources and that fulfills stakeholder expectations. So if you're thinking of a strategy in the exam, then that's what you need to think of, something that it does all of those things. To simplify it, I think of it as, first of all, choosing where to compete, secondly, choosing how to compete, and all of that needs to achieve competitive advantage. So if we were to sum it up, that's how we would sum it up. Johnson, Scholes and Whittington also looked at strategic decisions and some of the characteristics that make decisions strategic rather than just decisions. Well, first of all, any of the strategic decisions made will be affected by the scope of the business, i.e. what that business actually does. So any decisions on the strategy will depend on what the business is actually doing at the minute. Also, we need to try to match the activities that we seek to do to the environment at the minute. Now, that's the business environment that we're thinking of. Is the industry that we're in in decline? Should we be looking at new industries, new markets? Or should we be trying to uh, improve market share? Should we be trying to exploit the industry that we're currently in? So that's what the sort of thing we need to think about. Also, matching activities to resources. This is a big area. During this module, we'll look at what's called a resource audit. We'll determine what resources we have within the entity, and then we'll match what we intend to do to those resources so that we're making best use of them. So the resources that we'll have, we need to see how are we going to obtain any new resources that we need? How are we going to allocate the resources that we have or the resources that we obtain? And also, how are we going to control them? So how do we make best use of them within the organisation? Also, we need to think about the operational effects of our strategy. So although strategy will be set at a high level, we'll also need to think about the other areas of the business, those areas of the business that have to actually implement the strategy that we set from the top. We also need to manage stakeholder expectations. As I mentioned, we'll be looking in detail at stakeholders. We need to understand who the stakeholders are and what they expect from the business and ultimately how best we can provide those expectations for them. So remember, strategic decisions will determine the long term direction of the firm. We're not so much thinking about short term decisions. We're thinking about overall scope and direction. Where are we going over the long term as a business? The next area we need to be aware of is planning our strategy.
So again, thinking of Johnson Shoals and Whittington, they talked about three steps in planning the corporate strategy. And those three steps really are the three things that we look at throughout this module. So we break it down step by step. The first area is strategic analysis. This is really asking, where are we at the moment? So in strategic analysis, we can look at the external environment. We can look at that area that's outside the business, the uh, industry, for example, or the simply the overall economy. In that external environment will be opportunities and threats. Now, opportunities will be things that the business would seek to take advantage of, things that are out there that they could take advantage of and therefore increase shareholder wealth, make profit. However, out there as well in the external environment will be threats. Now, this could be competitors. It could be changes in legislation. It could even be regulations in your own industry that may be changes. So if those are changing, that will be a threat to the organisation. And the organisation will need to think, how are we going to deal with those threats? Looking at the internal environment, well, internally to the organisation, there will be strengths and weaknesses. Perhaps your strengths are your staff. Maybe you've got fantastic staff that give you something that other businesses don't have. But there could be weaknesses as well. For example, there could be weak internal controls that could lead to fraud or error. So we need to deal with those as a business when we're thinking about our corporate strategy. Analyzing these strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats is called a SWOT analysis, with the SW referring to the strengths and weaknesses, OT, opportunities and threats. So we need to know that opportunities and threats are external to the organisation, strengths and weaknesses are internal. And what we want to do is match those up. We want to match the opportunities to the strengths that we have within the firm, because we can then take best advantage of those opportunities. But we also want to look at those threats and make sure that those don't align with any of our weaknesses because that could spell disaster for the organisation. So we need to undertake an analysis to actually evaluate where we are with those. And that's the first step in setting a strategy, strategic analysis. You may also want to understand who your stakeholders are. Uh, we'll look at this throughout the module. Your stakeholders will be those who have a legitimate interest in the business and we need to keep them happy. So we need to decide who they are and what they want. We'll also conduct a gap analysis. Now, this is looking at the performance of the organisation. We're looking at the desired performance compared to the expected performance. If there's a gap between the two, if we don't expect to do what we would like to do, well, then we need to try to close that gap. But at this stage in strategic analysis, we're only trying to identify whether a gap exists. So once we've undertaken a strategic analysis within the firm, we can then decide what our strategic choices are. So those strategic choices should close any of the gaps that we've identified. We should close that gap between desired and expected performance. It also needs to fit in with our competitive strategy. We need to look at our competitors and make sure that our strategy can deal with them. It needs to give us a direction for our growth and it needs to determine what type of growth we expect, organic growth, mergers and acquisitions. All of these we'll look at throughout this module. So once we've undertaken step one and two, strategic analysis and strategic choice, we can then move on to strategic implementation. So once we've identified the strategic choices and decided what we're going to do, we simply need to implement it. So for that, we'll need plans and budgets. We'll need to set key performance indicators and we'll need to control how that strategy is implemented. And we'll look at all of those throughout the module. So this is a very useful way to think about strategy and to break down the different elements that we'll be looking at. Strategic analysis, where are we? Strategic choice, what could we do? Strategic implementation, implementing what we've chosen to do. So when we're looking at planning for our strategy, there are some different ways we could do it. We could undertake a rational model for strategy. Now, that would be planning our strategy step by step. Now, that would follow some sort of framework, a set framework like Johnson, Scholes and Whittington, um, strategic analysis, strategic choice and implementation. 
And that would mean that we have a very step-by-step -step approach to setting and following through with our strategy. However, we need to be aware that there are some problems with that. So, for example, how do we set that corporate strategy given that we need accurate forecasting to do it? Accurate forecasting is very difficult. If you set a corporate strategy that has no scope for flexibility, well then you're relying on your forecasts being very accurate and that's unlikely to be the case. That may result in short-termism, so focusing on those results that you can forecast more accurately, or indeed managers focusing on bonuses in the short term rather than focusing on the long-term direction of the firm. Ultimately, this may mean that following a set step-by-step -step framework is going to be too rigid. That can also stifle initiative because you're not allowing people the opportunity to change the plan. The plan is set, the step-by-step -step process is there, you can't get around it, and it can stifle initiative within the firm. It's also going to take time and cost money, which is a problem because anything that has a large amount of work involved in it will take time and will also cost the firm a lot of money. It may also be seen as a security blanket. Sometimes if a firm sets a plan, a very rigid plan that it's going to stick to, things happen outside the plan and they think, well, no, we're going to just stick to this no matter what. So that can be a problem for the firm in the long term as well. You'll find, and we'll look at it later on in the module, that there can often be a reluctance to change within the organisation. So if you've set this rigid plan which involves a lot of change, there can be a friction with the employees when you try to implement that change. And we'll look at how to reduce that whenever we see change management later on in the module. Also, many times employees will distrust the techniques used to implement these strategies. Often, will be, often it will be an outside organisation, uh, consultants that come in to set this strategy. The employees may distrust this and therefore will be reluctant to actually implement it. Also, ultimately, there is no evidence available to say that setting a rigid plan for a strategy, a step-by-step -step approach, actually works in practice. So what are the alternatives to this rational approach? Well, there is what's called an emergent approach to strategy. Now, this is just saying, well, let's let the strategy emerge. Let's not plan it too rigidly. So let's see where we're going. Let's see what opportunities open up. And then let's try to take advantage of those opportunities. And that will be our strategy. Now, this gives greater flexibility. So it won't stifle initiative as we saw with our rational strategy approach. So we will have flexibility to deal with different things as they come up. So it won't be a step-by-step -step approach. We'll simply say, right, where is the best opportunities available for this firm? And let's focus on those and move in that direction. Some other areas that you need to be aware of, approaches to setting budgets and therefore incorporating the strategy. First of all, accounting-led an accounting-led approach to planning the strategy and setting it will be, say, to go with a 5% increase on last year's budget. Now, that may work for not-for-profit organisations or for certain areas that will have a year-on-year -year inflationary increase, but it won't work for all areas. Oftentimes, we have one-off expenditure, we have different things that come up due to different areas being more important in, us in a year than other years, and therefore we have expenditure that fluctuates. So that 5% increase may not be correct for all areas of the business, but this is an approach that's often used in not-for-profit organisations. We could also use a market-led approach to planning. So this is looking at perhaps competitors or markets and saying, well, what are our competitors doing? How are we going to compete with that? And then setting our strategy and our plan based on that, a benchmarking of what those competitors are doing and looking at the markets to see what best way we can implement our strategy in those markets. Or there could be a resource-based strategy. This is focusing at the co on the core competencies within the organisation. So you start by saying, well, what resources do we have within the organisation? And how best can we use those resources to achieve competitive advantage? And that tends to be the approach that we'll be looking at most throughout this module. We also need to be aware when we're looking at planning our strategy of the different levels within the business. 
So looking at our little pyramid there, we can see that at the top of the organization, we have the strategic level. Now that strategic level is where the overall strategy will be set. That's at the board level. We then have the tactical level where business strategy will be set. And then at the bottom, we have the operational level where we have to actually put into place the strategy that we've decided from the top. So looking at each of these, we have the corporate strategy right at the top, the strategic level of the organization. Now, what are we asking at that level? We're asking which and new current of areas of business should we be involved in? So what areas should we be doing now? What areas do we intend to do in the future? So that's overall corporate strategy right at the top of the organization. On a business level, we'll at this level, we're thinking, how are we going to implement that? How are we going to go into the new areas of business? How are we going to make the current areas of business better? So what we're asking here is how can we make a success in the chosen market that we have, either the current market or a future market that we tend to go into? Lastly, at that functional or operational level, well, we're looking at the operations within the business. We're asking how are our marketing department, our HR, our information systems, our IT systems going to deal with this new strategy that we're going to implement? So do be aware of those different levels within the business and how the strategy feeds down from the top, but will affect all areas of the organization. When we're thinking about that top area of corporate strategy, we're thinking about those in charge, those charged with governance is how we might put it. So we need to understand what the relationship between the directors and the firm is, and also those directors, what a, do they have to do? What are they required to do under corporate governance requirements? So first of all, looking at the directors, the duties of the directors will incorporate all of the following. So they'll have to act within their powers. They can't usurp the power of others. They must act within the powers that have been dictated to them. They also have to promote the success of the company. They're there on behalf of the shareholders to run that organization. So they need to seek to make sure that that organization is successful. To do that, they need to use independent judgment. So particularly non-executive directors who are there to provide that independent view, they need to make that judgment independent of influence from others, be that other organisations, other directors or other bodies. Also, they need to take reasonable care, skill and diligence. So they're not just there uh, to make the money. They're there to actually use care, skill and diligence and promote that success of the company, make it better in some way. They must avoid conflicts of interest. That's very important. So they shouldn't have, for example, related party transactions. If they have several directorships with other organizations, they'll need to declare those interests. So they shouldn't benefit from any third parties within or outside that organization. And as I've said, they must declare any self-interest, be that related parties, other directorships, whatever it happens to be. Those directors are charged with looking after shareholders' interests. Remember, they are the agents of the shareholders, and that can raise the agency problem, where the shareholders' interests are long-term successful investments, whereas the directors are maybe more interested in short-termism, bonuses, etc. So that's the agency problem, and we need to think of ways that we can deal with that agency problem. Remember also other stakeholder interests need to be upheld by the directors. So we'll look at that in detail when we look at stakeholder analysis and how we deal with different stakeholders of the business. So remember we can split our directors between our executive and non-executive directors. First of all, looking at executive directors, these are the guys that make the decisions. They do the day-to-day -day workings of the business and deal with that. They must have full disclosure of their pay and that pay must be set by a remuneration committee, not by themselves. So they don't decide in their own pay. And of course that pay should be performance related. When it comes to non-executive directors, these guys are here to provide an independent view. So they should have some form of expertise in the area that they're asked to deal with. They should also have a transparent selection process that should be through a nomination committee 
and these will improve the credibility of the firm. For example, by forming part of an audit committee, an independent overseeing committee that looks at the work of internal audit and seeks to oversee to a certain extent the work of the directors. So those are some of the things we need to be thinking about whenever we look at the directors within an organisation, how they should deal with the organisation and how they should behave. Thinking a little bit about corporate governance requirements then, when it comes to the board, they are required to have regular meetings, so they must meet regularly. Generally speaking, that would be once a month. There must be a separation of power, so the same person shouldn't hold the position of CEO and chairperson or chairman on the board. So that position should be held by two different people to avoid unfettered power within the organisation. We also need a split of executive and non-executive directors. So that should be 50-50 in a large organisation, at least two non-executive directors in a small organisation. When it comes to reporting, uh, there needs to be full disclosure and it must be balanced. So there must be a balanced report each year. There needs to be full disclosure by the directors. The director should also publish each year in the annual report a statement of responsibility. All of the areas will be detailed in there that they take responsibility for and information that they should provide to the shareholders. So when we're thinking about strategy, what are the implications of governance and corporate governance rules and requirements on the strategy of the organisation? Well, the governance bodies within the organisation will be relatively powerful. So I'm thinking here about the audit committee, remuneration committee. Uh, These bodies will be powerful within the organisation, but that's because the governance requirements are there to make them powerful. It's to avoid risk, to try and reduce the risk to shareholders of um, the directors misusing their power, for example. So they should also then have an awareness of the shareholders' interests by having these independent bodies and independent directors within the organisation. However, this will have an implication on strategy. The first being, we'll have a need for a tight strategy, i.e. we need to be able to back up everything that we say in our strategic direction. We need to be able to justify decisions that those governance bodies make and decisions that the directors make at a board level for the strategic direction of the firm. So we need a tight strategy that's up uh, there with the best and can be backed up with other information. Also, we need to be aware that short-termism can occur. So we need to have those bodies looking out for that to avoid short-termism. Any strategy that we have needs to look at the long-term direction of the firm. Also, these governance bodies can actually lead to lower risk within the firm, and that's a good thing. However, that can also lead to lower return. The more risk one takes usually, the better return you're able to make. So if you're lowering the risk by having overseeing bodies like audit committees, remuneration committees, etc., etc., well then, you're going to potentially lower the return that is available to be made. But perhaps that is something that the the shareholders will be willing to accept simply to get that lower risk that they will therefore have. But do be aware of it when it comes to governance requirements. It lowers the risk of the firm, but that potentially can lead to a lower return for shareholders. Let's now look at illustration one. So this is a scenario based illustration. It's typical of the sort of thing that will come up in the exam and What I want to do is give you an idea of how we should be approaching these questions, how they can come up and how much detail we need to give when we're looking at the answers. So although this is the first lecture, we're also already going to start looking at different strategies. Now, it's not going to be looking at the detail of the different approaches we can take. We're simply looking at a scenario and we're going to give sensible suggestions as to what strategies they could come up with. So it's to give you an idea of what strategy means and how strategy impacts or can impact on a firm and of course how we can apply that in the exam. Illustration one then is looking at a scenario. We have F, a company with various problems. Now make sure that you have read through the scenario. You might want to make some notes or even have a go at the answer yourself before you work through this with me. So you must have read the scenario at least. 
So looking first of all at the requirements. So requirement one asks us to discuss the main difficulties faced by F. Fairly straightforward, just make sure that we've identified what the verb is here. So uh, it's to discuss the main difficulties and that's going to tell us how many marks we're going to get for the points that we actually have to make. So that also tells us how much do we need to write for each point we make. Now at this level we need to start thinking that one line answers are not going to be enough. We're talking about two and a half, three lines to get one mark here. So make sure that we get five clearly discussed and relevant points to get full marks. That does not mean five lines. It means five clearly discussed points. So looking at the difficulties that F have at the moment. So I want you also to focus in the exam on structuring your answer in the way that I am here. So we've got a heading, it's underlined so that the examiner can immediately see what you're going to talk about. Then we're going to break up each point with a little discussion and then leave a line. So we're saying to the examiner, look, we've got a little bit of discussion here and we therefore want some marks for it. Then we move on to the next bit and we get our next mark for that. So the first difficulty that we have, well, we can see that the company's turnover and profits are being affected by the loss of the home market share. We've got foreign companies coming in. If we don't remedy this, it's going to lead to foreign companies dominating this market. So that's fully discussing what the problem is. It's not just saying foreign companies are coming into their main market. That's not going to be enough at this level. We need to say why that's a problem and what it could lead to. The next difficulty is that um, we can see that effectively there's a price war going on here in the market for beer crates. Now that market for beer crates is particularly important to F. It's their main market. It's the one that uh, gives them the most of their turnover and profit. So that's going to be a very damaging state of affairs since that sale of beer crates constitutes a large part of its business. So that's the next difficulty. The difficulty and why it's a difficulty. That's what discuss means. Also, the company has problem with labour relations and working practices. Uh, this will be affecting efficiency in production processes and therefore profitability. So unless this is resolved, it won't be possible to remedy some of the other difficulties that they face. So again, we're fully discussing it. We're not just saying what the problem is. We're saying why it's a problem, what, we might be, uh, what might the implications of that problem be. Also, we can see that the research and development department is dysfunctional. So the developments that they have aren't achieving commercial success. Research and development is very high cost and if you're not getting positive impact, well then that is going to be a problem. So although there are existing prospects, past performance suggests that these will not come to the market unless changes are made to the department. So they need to look at that research and development department and think how can we change it, how can we make it better. So that's uh, the next difficulty. The last difficulty is that they have this problem with their institutional shareholders. They obviously haven't informed them fully of what's happening within the organisation and how it's affecting its org operations. So although this doesn't have an immediate effect on profitability, that's going to make it harder for them to make or where necessary fund changes to remedy the difficulties. Because if we don't inform the shareholders, they're less likely to support us when we try to do things to remedy difficulties that we face. So those are the difficulties faced. I want you to focus here more on the structure of the answer and how much we're writing for each one. So we're thinking use a line and then a heading to start off to say what we're going to talk about. And then for each discussion, we're going to discuss it over several lines of writing, leaving a line between each little discussion so that we're identifying to the examiner exactly where we want our marks. So that was part A. When we're looking at part B then, requirement B, or sorry, requirement two, it asks us to identify and evaluate alternative strategies that F could adopt to address its difficulties and recommend those that are most appropriate. So what we need to do when we get a requirement like this is to break it down. So there are two 
requirements initially. We need to identify and evaluate alternative strategies that F could adopt. So we need to identify the potential strategy and then evaluate it, i.e. say if it's going to work or how it will work. Then we need to recommend those that are most appropriate. Remember, we're looking for a detailed discussion of a select number of good suggestions here. We're not going to come up with maybe 10 one-line strategies. They could do this, they could do that. At this level, we need to think in more detail and give more information to the examiner to fully discuss each point that we're looking at. That's what they're looking for at this sort of level. So when we're thinking about a uh, part two, the first strategy we could come up with would be to reduce the price of the beer crates. So we're going to look really at each of the difficulties that the business is facing. And we're going to say, well, what could we do to deal with it? So that's what a strategy is. It's looking at how the business is running at the minute, what problems there are. Well, let's get a strategy for dealing with those problems. So strategy one, reduce the price of your beer crates. Now, and the explanation of that will be that the foreign competitors are currently undercutting F in the price of these beer crates. Therefore, they could reduce the prices to compete with them. Now, to be successful in a price war like this, they'll need to do a couple of things. They'll need to, number one, keep the prices competitive as long as the price war lasts so that they can maintain their, their market share. So they can't a jump out of it at any stage they need to keep the pressure on they need to keep the prices low for as long as they can they'll also need to try to reduce their costs to maintain their profitability if you reduce your price that's going to put pressure on your margin so you'll need to try to reduce costs in line with that in order to maintain profitability now, the stakeholders have suggested a withdrawal from the beer crate market, but that's unlikely to be a wise move. So let's point that out to the examiner. Now, the beer crates market makes up a large share of F's business, so it's unlikely that they can simply replace that with something else in the short term. So that could be very damaging to the business if they were just to go ahead and pull out of that market altogether. So that's our first strategy, reduce the prices of the beer crates. Other things we could do, well, we could consider exporting beer crates. So take these foreign competitors on in their own markets. So we should consider producing beer crates for other markets in the world. By exporting, we could achieve larger volumes and economies of scale, and that might allow us to compete more aggressively in our home market. Maybe we could reduce our costs through those economies of scale. It does look like if we could establish a manufacturing base in other countries, we might be able to reduce our costs. The fact that the foreign companies are able to compete by importing crates to F's market, well, that suggests that there are costs in their uh, manufacturing process that need to be dealt with. They need to reduce their costs to try and compete with these foreign competitors. And maybe going abroad and setting up a manufacturing base there could do that. The next strategy we could look at is to deal with the unions. Now this seems to be one of the main problems that they have, the unionised work practices. So initiative ought to be made by the board to rationalise work practices within the company and make them more flexible. They currently have rigid work practices, too many labour grades, rigid de job demarcation and a cumbersome ne negotiation system. And all of that means that they're having difficulties and it's actually increasing their costs. So as we've just said, the cost structure can be accounted for by a lot of this and that's impeding their performance in the market. They're going to need the support of the workforce and the unions to actually change these practices and they need to get an agreement in principle to simplify them and to make the changes required. So what can they do? Well, if they were to make these work practices more flexible, that would have several implications. Number one, it would help reduce their operating costs. Also, it could create some redundancies. Now, both of those are going to reduce our overall costs. Redundancies means we don't have to pay those people. Now, it'll require careful consideration and negotiations with the workforce at an individual factory level. And do be aware that in the short term, the costs of the redundancies may well offset the labour cost savings. But in the long term, the benefits should be worth pursuing. Remember, strategy relates to the long term. So that's what we're interested in. 
The last strategy that I have thought of is to deal with the research and development issues. So it looks here like the market for beer crates is price sensitive, but there does seem to be new product possibilities in the field of electroplastics. You would imagine, based on the information, that this market is only just being created. So other elements in the marketing mix could be critically important. We, moved, we could actually develop this product, market it to customers and see big improvements. So they should develop a strategy of making their R&D investments more commercially aware. How could they do that? Well, number one, they could put greater emphasis on marketing in the group, especially in the factories responsible for the new electroplastic technology. They could encourage factory managers to find out what sort of products customers actually want rather than just making the ones that they get excited about. Ask the customers what they want. Uh, you could also require your research and development department to invest the bulk of its funds into projects selected by the operating factories. So the operating factories who know what sells and know how to produce it could actually advise the research and development department. Also then we could look at ensuring that the research and development is adequate to keep the company at the forefront of new technological developments, maybe by setting them some targets, for example. So all in all, bringing those together, the recommendation would be to, number one, protect existing markets and market share by reducing prices as well as cutting and controlling costs. Number two, widen the market, not rely so heavily on the home market. Number three, rationalise those work practices to deal with the inflexibility within the organisation. And number four, try to exploit new technological developments by having a market-driven research and development department. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how strategy can be examined and how strategy can be used to actually deal with difficulties within an organisation. Throughout the rest of the module, we're going to be looking at specifics on how we go about developing that strategy. But this was just to give us a general feel for what a strategy is within an organisation. That was our lecture then on strategy formation. Remember, this is an introductory lecture just to say what the areas are that we're going to be looking at, to think about the different levels within the business, and of course, who sets the strategy within the business. We'll then be going on to look at a lot of these areas in greater detail throughout the module.